Two cops copy log on. Who's clicking? Who is clicking? Who do you think's clicking? The same person that was meowing oh, in the last episode. I'm not clicking. Unless you hear my mouse. That's what I'm saying. You're clicking. <laughs> I gotta edit all those out now. Man. If they uh, even pop up. Sometimes they don't pop up. That's why you can kind of hear them sometimes. I hate you. <laughs> I hate you so much. He's like, here, go ahead and fix this. Well, let's get started then. Let's get into it. This is going right. to be a good one because it's got a little bit of of advice. It's got a little bit of fun stories. It's got a little bit of what not to do, right? It's got a little bit of blood and gore in it. Not a lot. We can make bit. it a lot. Well, I don't think we want to <laughs> scare anybody. <laughs> but today we're going to talk about with Las Vegas being a tourist area, a tourist town, and where people come and party and hang out and gamble, we're going to talk about the tourist safety division of of being a police officer, as well as kind of what not to do when you're in Vegas, and talk a little bit about the types of attempted suicides type calls that we get from specifically tourists that are here visiting that tend to ruin their life in Vegas for some reason. So we're going to get into all of that. But first, of course, Fuzz has his new story for us. What is it today, Fuzz? Florida? Flying? What's it going to be? <laughs> uh, this one's out of Michigan. A bald, uh-huh. eagle, attack, a bald eagle attacks a drone. Uh, a bald <laughs> eagle launched an aerial assault on a drone operated by the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes, and Energy. And this is the best part. They're also known as E-G-L-E, or Eagle. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, the bald eagle wow. ripped off its drone and sent the aircraft into lake michigan the attack happened on july 21st when the drone was mapping shoreline erosion in michigan's upper peninsula to document and help communities cope with high water levels environmental quality analysis analysis in the drone pilot hunter king said he had completed about seven minutes of the mapping flight when satellite reception became spotty he pressed a button to return the $950 drone back to him and was viewing his video screen when the drone began to twirl. It was like a bad roller coaster ride, said King. He looked up and saw the eagle flying away, apparently unhurt by its confrontation with the drone. The drone sent 27 warning messages in the three and a half seconds that it took to spiral into the water, including one <laughs> noting that a propeller was missing. A search of the shoreline failed to, f- uh, failed to find the drone. Data later revealed that it landed in four feet of water about 150 feet from the shore. Eagle's drone team is current considered is considering what, what it can do to reduce the possibility of a repeat attack, including possibly using skins and other designs on the aircraft mm-hmm. to make it look less like seagulls. So yeah. That's great. So it attacked it because it looked like a seagull. I guess. I mean it doesn't say that directly, but based on the last sentence, yes. That's the most America story you could say. Yeah. <laughs> I love how the drone ripped the, or the eagle ripped the part of drone. I love yeah. that. Not my house, not today. Don't, don't tread on me. <laughs> don't tread on me. <laughs> <laughs> no step on snake. Mm-hmm. And I love that the abbreviation is for this Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy is Eagle. That's I great. love that. How dare you Talk use Talk about name. coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> and they found the drone, yes. No, they haven't yet. Oh, I thought it was only in like four feet of water, 100 feet off the shore. That's where it landed, but they didn't say they found it. Ah. And the drone, so there's video of it then. That's what he said. He saw the actual like attack. Well, he saw it on video as a live feed, but I don't think the, I don't know if the video recorded. Oh, would they have to get the drone to record it? Well, that too. I'm just wondering, is there any video that we can post when we post this? No, there is not. Dang it. Dang. It's like one of my favorite parts is watching the videos. I'm a visual kind of person. Don't laugh at me. Me no smart. Uh All right. (laughs) 
enough of that, I guess. Um, for you story time. Smart. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you already called me out for being a redneck. You already called me out for being not smart. Fact. And I don't know if anybody, yeah, I don't know if anybody caught it in episode <laughs> seven. But when I say like my height and weight out of the academy, which was my height and weight out of the academy, well, I'm I'm like more like five seven, but I digress. <laughs> Fuzz is over there in the background, and he's like, "Yeah, you're not one sixty. There's no way." Mm-hmm. Like, okay, I don't know if anybody caught that, but go back. It was a hidden story. little gem when he went back to listen yeah. to it again. <laughs> I didn't even catch it when we were recording. I had to text him later. And I was like, "Wow, you're a jerk. It's messed up." Well, you're not one sixty. Well, not anymore, but I was, yeah, and I'm only like one seventy now. You're at least two hundred now. now. Like, you wish, bro. <laughs> <laughs> You wish. I've never been 200. I'm like 175 now. You got to get those numbers up. You got to get those, those numbers. Those are rookie numbers. Get that dad bod going. I already have a dad bod, dude. That's why I got the 10 pounds from like, or 15 from 160 to 175. I got it, bro. Oh, man. It's all those, those donuts I pick up and bring on my motorcycle home. Like, donuts? You mean first, second, and third lunch you have? Yeah. <laughs> I don't get that on motors. It's not as luxurious. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's there's no way to eat and ride like you can in a car. I've seen you riding with a hot dog in hand. <laughs> no, it was in my mouth. Get it right. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of hot dog? Uh, oh, okay, all right, all right. Moving on. All right, moving on to story time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got some good stories for this week. Um, we've had kind of a comparison between a story last week with Flying Fuzz and Roxas. And then we've got some some sneaky stuff going on. So I'll let Fuzz start. Uh, tell Again, me. Oh, you're the one that put it in the outline with you in front. Well, this one is an armor call, call out. So for those that don't know, here locally we have a unit called Armor. And they're basically, it's a fancy name for the bomb squad. So there was a call that came out and... First of all, let me say that this day was, I was DP this day. I was not supposed to be taking calls. I was supposed to be doing proactive stuff and no one was helping Sarge and Sarge is going to all these calls by himself. So I'm back in Sarge all day. Well, then this call comes out, it's a suspicious situation call and the details say that the person reporting found a grenade sitting on the trash can. Hmm. So Sarge assigns himself. Of course, no one goes with Sarge to help him. So I go and I back Sarge and we get there right at about the same time and I walk up to the trash can and I'm looking at it and I was like, that's a grenade. <laughs> but I was using my Call of Duty instinct and I was like, eh, it looks more like a smoke. It looks like more of a smoke grenade if Call of Duty taught me anything. And uh Sarge walks up and he's looking at it. And now our sergeant was he was in the military, so I'm expecting him to kind of be like, Oh yeah, whatever. But he walks up and he looks at it for a few minutes. And then he walks back across the street and I follow him and he's like he starts getting on his phone and he's like Hey, flying fuzz, we need to start because there were, you know, neighbors were out and stuff. And he's like, uh, can you start pushing the neighbors back and stuff? And that's when I realized it was serious. <laughs> All of a sudden, did it hit you? You're like, oh, yeah. no. <laughs> now that our military, ex military sergeant is like telling everyone to back up. So get everyone back, close off the street. He makes a few phone calls. He's like, okay, armor's going to come out. He's, he wants me to do the briefing, so I start getting the briefing ready, which I'm like, well, all I really got is a PR and a grenade sitting on top of a trash can, so it would be an easy <laughs> brief. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I get the brief ready. One by one, armor starts showing up, and one of them like, walks up to me, and he's like, hey, I just need the event number and the PR, so I give it to him, and that was it. That was the brief. <laughs> uh, brief over then like the three of them the three bomb squad armor guys they walk over to it and uh they're kind of like hmm interesting like they were a little surprised by it but it still had the spoon on it and it still had the pin in it hmm. so they take electrical tape they don't even suit up or anything this it literally took them like 10 minutes they put electrical tape around the spoon and then they put electrical tape long like the long ways over top of where the striker would be to basically hold everything down and they throw it in an ammo can and that was that and then we opened up the road so it's pretty quick but yeah it was very interesting that was my first armor call out and that was actually my sergeant's first armor call out as well 
We had the other one that he tried to, where there was like a lantern, like a Halloween lantern with some cables sticking out of it, and he wanted to call him, and then we realized what it was and kicked it over and kind of just ended it there. Oh, I might have been gone that day, but because th- that sounds familiar, I feel like I've heard that story. But it I was on bikes. I think it was next to the Four Queens uh, Casino. Hmm. I love how they put it in the ammo can. Yeah. Yeah. Like he's gonna save it. <laughs> like ah, in case it's it fine. goes off, this is fine. It's fine. No big deal. It's fine. Yeah. It's fine. So yeah, I've that was my story. I had the armor call out where the dude blew himself up. Because we found wires in the mailbox, but that was about it. Huh. Was that in field training? No, no, that was that was downtown. That was with Mahar and Smith, where we it's the dude with the burnt guns and stuff. We pulled like oh. 18 guns out of his house or whatever. Yeah. With the, the I didn't realize there were wires in his trash can or his mailbox that he blew up. No, they I thought he was just doing stupid shit in his house and blew his house up. Yeah, so he was. He blew his house up and then we walked up to the house after FD was all done with it and Carter looked over and there's wires and all this stuff hanging out of the mailbox and we're like, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're going to go away. <laughs> and it, out and it was just like a, it ended up being like an alarm system huh. for, it was just an alarm system for his mailbox is what hmm. it was. It was weird. But he had a bunch of homemade crap, homemade suppressors, homemade firearms, he had a an old school like Mazin like rifle with Mosin the Gaunt. Sure, whatever. <laughs> Something like that. Something older. I think it was actually like a Springfield 30 out six, but it was just an old, old version. And it had this little like World War II scope on it, and then it had a camera hooked up to the scope. Like to where he could just mount it. It was weird. He's a weird dude. Hmm. I never had to go to court for it, so I wonder how that turned out. I don't know. Not sure. Anyways, my well, story. Oh, okay. What? No, go ahead. I was just going to say you had a pretty good story today or this week with your buddy. Uh, it's it's pretty funny. It didn't really yield a lot. Like, it sounds like it would yield a lot, but it didn't. But it's kind of funny. So I had another ride along with, uh, with Piper, who lives with me, and... He came out, we took out an unmarked Ford Taurus. So it's just a, it's like a silver Ford car sedan and all like all tinted and such. So you can't really tell that there's police officers inside unless you look through the windshield. Well, we are driving to Sonic to get food because of course, you know, we have to have our food as we drive around. So we're going to Sonic, we go through an intersection you have to have and your fast food. Well, and <laughs> nothing else is opened. There it is. <laughs> Nothing else is open. So it, it was like... Uh, IHOP, Denny's. Does IHOP and Denny's even do like sit down? I'm not sitting down in those places. You kidding me? Anyways, regardless of where we were going to eat, fast food, okay? We go through this intersection and Piper looks over and he's like, dude, that car just rear-ended that other car. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Are you serious? Like, I just wanted to go eat. So I'm like, okay, look, we're in the unmarked car. We'll flip around. We'll go back by. If they're going to like get on their phone and start calling people, I'll just get out and do the report really, really quick because it's basic. If they aren't, like if they all are going to get in their cars when we drive up, then we, they don't want to report and we'll just let them go because it's, you know, if you don't have a victim, you can't do anything. If they don't want to report and both parties don't want to report, then that's on them. So we pull up behind them and as we, we start to pull up, we see everybody going to get in their cars. So I turn my hazards on in the car i don't turn the red and blue lights on that are hidden in the vehicle i just turn the hazards on because i'm like okay well they're getting back in their cars turn the hazards on block traffic and then we'll let them leave so they get back in their cars the passenger of the car that rear-ended the first car he like tries to wave us around we're like no don't worry about it like we'll set your block traffic for you they get in their cars and the first car pulls off and leaves and as the second car starts to roll forward the passenger door opens again we're like what the heck like why is this guy being weird? Well, he throws a like tall boy Bud Light out the passenger door. Oh. <laughs> now, now I'm like, okay, now I obviously have to do something because obviously there's signs that he's probably driving under the influence of whatever it may be. Alcohol, obviously, with the beer kit. 
so then we're like, oh, okay, so we hit our red and blues on it, and they like they were dumbfounded. They were like, holy crap, where did they come from? <laughs> we had no idea. No one's and called yet. Dude, yeah, this dude like waved us on, like looking at us with shield and granted our headlights are facing him and it's dark out. And then I had my window down. I was like, no, nah, bro, don't worry about it, like talking to him. And <laughs> they get back in the car and he does this, and they just look back and they both just like put their hands on the dashboard and lean forward. And we're like, all right. So it, it's an unregistered vehicle, so we call it out. And we go up to the window. And as soon as I see this dude, I can tell that he's high. Like, he's not just drunk. He's high. He's got his hands up on the steering wheel. So my buddy's like, hey, yeah, we're stopping you because you threw a Bud Light can out the window. And he's like, what? Like, no. Like, both of them are. And I'm kind of laughing at him. And I'm like, hey, bro, like, you got your driver's license insurance registration on you. And so I'm looking around the vehicle. And as I look down, he's got the the end of a Glock magazine and a grip for a pistol. Um, coming out from under his leg. So I'm like, hey, bro, just keep your hands where they're at. Like, And he's like, oh, yeah, I have this gun. And I was like, yeah, I can see that now. You probably should have said something before, right? And he's like, well, blah. I'm like, okay, all right, whatever. Just So I tell him, like, hey, like, just go ahead with your right hand, take the seatbelt off. With your left hand, open your door. Um, make sure the gun's not going to fall and you grab it when you get out of the truck because I don't want you trying to grab this gun while I'm right here. Like, no matter what, especially with you being high. He ends up stepping out, you know, pat him down, make sure there's no other weapons. I put him in front of our car. And the other guy's also just a little bit not paying attention and not really focused. Whether he's nervous or whatnot, he wasn't really that drunk, but whether he's nervous or not. And so my partner's like, hey, bro, is there any other guns in the car? While I'm moving this other guy. And... He's like, no, no. And he starts like reaching under his seat. Like, what the heck? Like, what are you <laughs> doing? And so my partner has him at gunpoint, like yelling at him, like, dude, get your hands up. Like, what the F are you doing? Like, I don't want to have to shoot you. Like all this stuff, because it's, we don't know what's there. And the, the other gun is still on the passenger or on the driver's seat. Mm-hmm. Because we didn't have, I didn't have time to grab that yet while he's directing this guy. And so I'm like, holy crap, what's happening? So I leave my guy, go back over there. Um, Dude's like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Puts his hand back on the dash, doesn't move. We end up opening the door, getting him out, and there's a gun on the floorboards. Oh, God. And it's just, it's irritating it because, it, it, it does. It sounds a lot worse than it is, but it's irritating because, like, had we known the gun was there, it might have ended differently, and really for nothing, just because this guy wasn't paying attention. Mm-hmm. Like, they weren't bad. Like, yes, he was driving high and drunk, um, but and they were very, they were pretty young. They weren't really affiliated with anything. Like, it wasn't like they were out to do drive-by shootings. Neither of the guns were stolen. Like the passenger got to take his gun and leave because he wasn't committing a crime by being in a vehicle with a drunk driver. Like he wasn't driving. So at the end of the day, it really wasn't anything. It was a DUI arrest for the driver, but it just... It's irritating because all you have to do is just listen. Like, we are going to guide you in the way that is going to be best for everybody because we don't want to be placed in that situation either. Mm-hmm. So it's really because if, if we would have seen the gun or know the gun was there, and the gun didn't even have any bullets in it. It was like they had like just bought them that day. And, and they so just they just had them out and about, and that's it? Yeah, they didn't even have any ammo or anything. And it's like they had a bag of like 22 ammo in their trunk. And then the driver had like five rounds in his pistol, but the passenger had nothing. And it was in a holster, just like on the ground or like in the passenger door or something. And it really wasn't a huge deal. Like, especially not for me. Like I'm a very like pro gun person. If yeah. somebody tells me they have a gun, like in the center console, I'm like, all right, cool. Like just leave it there. Like no big deal. You're allowed to have that. Unless I find something different, then I'll address you and I'll address it when it comes that time. But right now, I have no reason to touch your gun, to ask about your gun, to anything like that, unless you're willing to work with me on it and give me that. Mm -hmm. So it sounds really like hyped up, but it it really wasn't a huge deal. The funniest part is that we, we totally, like it was a sneak attack. Like we were just trying to get lunch and just snuck up on him and then just it was kind of i felt kind of bad like we did it kind of dirty because it was sneaky that's where it should be sneaky i think it's easier to get stuff like that if if you're being sneaky but 
yeah, it was, man, we definitely took advantage of the plain car and not having any, like, markings or anything on the outside. It just looks like a normal car. Yeah. You tried to be sneaky, just sit back, watch everything go on, and then all of a sudden you're involved. Yeah, as soon as he threw out the the beer can, it was like, okay. Crap. Great. <laughs> that was the passenger that did that, right? Yes, but either way, it's still. Did you write the passenger a ticket for littering? No, I did not. I could have, was yes. The passenger, uh, the passenger was not drunk. The, was pass- he high? the passenger was not high. In fact, he retained his firearm and he left the scene or waited for somebody to come pick him up or something like that. You should have wrote him a ticket for littering. No, that's yes. not. No, that's, yes. like a, that's like a downtown thing. Okay, Mr. Stats. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to say my next comments because it gets kind of political with uh, stats. But I'll tell you guys later. I... Do you want me to do work? <laughs> hmm. Roxas, what do you got? What's your story this week? All right. So my story is more about people getting out of uh, doing things to get out of jail. So to put in context, how many times have we gone on a call where someone fakes a medical situation to get out of going to jail. Just between the three of us, like how often does that happen? Like when we worked in the uh, like DTAC area, like down on Fremont. All the time. All the time. Anytime that we had yeah. anyone down there that knew that they were going to jail, they were having a hard time breathing, they were having a heart attack, they were having an asthma attack, they were having something. And we, they thought that that would get them out of going to jail. And we took them to jail every time. Didn't matter because we knew that they were faking it and we'd just move on and go through the steps call them medical, medical would tell them they're faking it and we'd go to jail. Well, it's not the same for everyone else who goes to these calls because they don't, they don't see the same way. So someone on swing shifts went out on a couple of people on bikes without lights. And at the exact same time, the male and female both start having seizures. They just fall down, start shaking and that's the end of it. So she didn't know what was going on. So she calls out a red, gets like calls from medical. So we're all rolling code to her. We get down there. Medical's already on scene. They're like already telling this guy, hey, you know, you're not having a seizure. You're just doing stupid things and shaking and being dumb. So they're all like prepared to give this guy a ticket. He's got warrants, all this other stuff. And I was like, no, 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 no. They're already telling you that he's faking. It. I was like, this guy needs to go to jail. Now, mind you, it's like 2330, so there's like 30 minutes before swing shift is going home, so they really don't want to take him down to the hospital and sit on him and then take him to jail. So I volunteered because I know exactly how this stuff goes, but the story is that they were just ready to you know, be like everyone else and just hand him a ticket and kick him loose, and he was going to pop back up, take his ticket, and he was going to go about his day as if he didn't do anything wrong. But those of us that deal with this every day, we know that if you fake being sick or injured we know it and we will still take you to jail i think too like right now people are using coronavirus because they think it's going to get them out oh yeah they end up getting to jail and the nurses tell them like hey like if you have coronavirus just so you know you have to go to a cell all by yourself and sit there and basically be on quarantine for however long two weeks you're by yourself what They're like, oh, I have, to, I have to stay here if I have coronavirus? Okay, I don't really have it. I'm sorry, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. I've had that happen a lot, especially with DUIs. It's common. Everyone thinks that they're going to get some kind of special treatment by saying that they have something. And they're like, all right, cool. You're just making this worse than yourself. Yeah, you are. And you're making everything longer, too. Like, Guess what? Now you get a medical bill. Exactly. You got a medical bill. <laughs> you've got you've got the time it takes because you're still gonna go to jail. And that time at jail, that process doesn't start until you get there. Yep. And so, I'm finishing my paperwork. So you know what? I might not be feeling very intelligent about writing your DOA tonight. It's funny because people are like, Oh, I have to be at work in the morning. Oh, but I'm gonna like pretend this and this. And the thing is is when people pretend like we have the duty to do the steps. Like we call for medical. We don't know. We can't say you're faking. We're not doctors. So so we have to go through the whole process and it just prolongs everything for them. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Yep. And like I said, now they've got a medical bill and they get transported by medical. I know that's a good, like four grand right there just for a, an AMR ride. Speaking of, uh, medical bills and AMR really quick. I went to a, (laughs) I went to a wreck this morning 
and it was this dude. He tried to go like straight through the roundabout instead of going around the Oops. roundabout. And there was a tree there, so he couldn't go straight. He found out, but he he's laying in the hospital, the gurney of the ambulance. And I mean, it's like six o'clock, so I'm explaining to him like, "Hey, bro, like this is what's gonna happen. We're gonna go down there. We're gonna get blood. I have an officer down there. Like, if you're gonna get admitted or have to have surgery, and then I look over at his his right leg, and his his right foot, like, you know, if you're laying down, your right foot usually, like, is sticking up, right? If you're laying on your back. So it was sticking, like, flat and then to the left. That's not like, normal. Like, flat with the gurney. And I looked at it. <laughs> I looked at it. I was like, uh, yeah, that's pretty bad. So you're probably just going to get a ticket because you're going to be admitted. And here's this is how it's going to work. But I'll just explain everything to him. And it was, it's one of those things where sometimes we can do that. When you look at something and it's obvious. But if you're faking a seizure or saying you're sick, like that's not on us. We have to have medical professionals for that. Mm -hmm. All right. We're going to get into the actual purpose now, the topic, if you would call it, um, and talk about the the tourist safety aspect of our jobs um, with like, like everything that goes on here, right? So Fuzz, what exactly would you define the tourist safety division as? Pretty much the areas of the valley where there's a high concentration of tourists, but not just tourists, locals as well, that are just out to have a good time. I think the big thing about that, too, is it's it's also like a large gathering of people. Mm -hmm. So it's not just it's not just the threat of something happening from an outside source, but it's also a threat of like when you get a lot of people together, especially if they've been drinking or doing something stupid yeah. there's tensions tend to flare and that's where we get a lot of our fights going on or even like nowadays like shootings down in tourist areas where two people get in an argument and then they both pull guns out and start shooting each other it's because there's a lot of because of the corona thing and everything is so cheap people that normally would not be able to afford a trip to vegas now coming to vegas and that's where i think a lot of the problems in the touristy areas with, that we're seeing lately with shootings and stabbings lately yes are yeah. stemming flights from. are cheap rooms are cheap gambling's still not cheap i can tell you that <laughs> how much did you lose i have i haven't gambled i've just been listening to family members tell me um i would agree with that i think it's definitely right now with the coronavirus and such going on there's People that aren't working that just want to come and play and everything's cheaper right now. Yeah. So the amount of like hip hop music videos being filmed in casinos right now is at an all time high. Hmm. Everyone's uh, everyone's a high roller when you're spending seven dollars for a room at the stratosphere. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. I think the other part of the big issue with these areas is that they're also the this national hub for not only tourism but it's where a lot of the revenue comes from for the money that's made in the city these casinos the entertainment that's there whether it's gambling or a hotel or the bars that's all that's where a lot of the revenue comes from so it's a big thing an asset to protect where even on a national level like if you wanted to do harm to the united states it's it's a hub on where there's sensitivity for those types of attacks, I guess you could say. Right. I've always been kind of told, because I was born and raised here locally in the city, I've always kind of been told that the tourism is it's the bread and butter of the city. If it went away, which we saw during the shutdown, yeah. you know, this not just this city, it's a big hub for this state as well, revenue-wise. So you see a, a big a big pitfall when you're pretty much one and only industry tourism is shut down, even just for a couple months. Yeah. It's kind of, it was really crazy to see like going riding down the strip to see how just empty it was while yeah. coronavirus was shut down. I, there was nobody on the roads. It was just me. Yeah. Yeah. My family's saying the same thing right now. Like even with things being opened up, they're driving up and down the strip. They're like, I don't know what's open. Like nothing's open yet. Like you want to go gamble, that's fine. But they're like, well, where do I go to get a steak dinner? Uh, that you don't. <laughs> that you don't get. You, uh, <laughs> you cook it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can give them some uh, money while gambling, but uh, you're not getting anything in return. So with, we talked about FTEP 
um, episode seven. Yeah. And we talked about how we have to do at least one of these areas. I did downtown. Downtown was my uh, tourist division area where there's Fremont Street and those kind of areas for tourists. But it's not all tourist, which is kind of funny because if you're on Graveyard downtown, you don't, unless you're bikes, you don't really deal with that. Mm -mm. Which luckily, we've all had that opportunity to work bikes. And it... Well, I think when you're on Graveyard, the reason you don't really deal with it is because of bikes. Yeah. Because bikes offset. Because they're on yes. Graveyard. Yeah. And that's what I mean, is if you, if there's the bike units there, that's kind of their bread and butter, their main hub. So you don't deal with it on the patrol side unless you're on bikes or you have friends in bikes or... Uh, somebody on your squads and bikes and so mm -hmm. we've all had where some shit goes down yep. yes if if something big happens the whole whole area is coming and we're going to kind of get into those stories and that side of it um in a minute when we talk about what not to do as a tourist visiting vegas because we don't mess around very much here especially not in our tourist areas where there are specific laws and ordinances put for those specific areas and we'll get into that but with downtown as as day shift and training for ftep i really didn't have to deal with it a ton and it's partly because nobody's really there during the day either and the people that are there during the day aren't getting drunk causing problems they're the people that are just going for the sites yeah they're actually taking pictures yeah. probably have kids with them not causing a whole bunch of issues now fuzz you worked downtown so you worked ccac for FTEP, yeah, I worked right? the strip. Yep. And what, how is that different? How does that differ? And what shift was it? Uh, I was graveyard. So I dealt with a lot of the drunk people. Um, it's very similar to how bikes was downtown. Only the casinos and the properties that you're responsible for, or like, are like four times, five times the size of the ones downtown. Mm. They're massive properties. They got their, I mean, some of the properties have their own little investigative units and sections that help with uh like trick roll investigations with the prostitutes they they're just as good as our local vice unit in some regards because they know all the players it's i mean i don't know i would definitely say security on the strip is they know their shit a little bit more than the ones downtown mm -hmm. um you would show up on like a domestic violence call right security already has them in custody voluntaries are already done pretty much all you got to do is do the interviews figure out who's going to jail, hook them up and take them to jail. Like security does a lot of the, a lot of the legwork for us on a lot of stuff too. And they know exactly what we need and all that stuff. So that's how I would say it was, it differs is security, like security at all those major properties. There's very much like a mini police department. I would, I, I would stretch to say compared to downtown where it's like, we kind of have to, we have to kind of pull that information out of them. Do you guys get like large groups and such when somebody's being arrested, whether it's them recording or them arguing with you? Do you get that the same way we had in downtown? Uh, the only one I can think of that he was resisting when we hooked him up, no. Um, normally, every time someone is resisting, that's the other thing about the strip too, is a lot of when we get involved as police, you know, obviously that looks bad on the casino and the hotel. So they try and push it off into like, you know, around the corner or in the security office away from where everyone can see. Yeah. You. So a lot of the times we did get people resisting arrest or that kind of thing was very, it was out of the eye, out of the public's eye. Even the one, like we had one girl, she was probably the worst. We call it code five when they're resisting for everyone at home. She was probably the worst code five I've ever had. I was solo beat at the time and our FTOs were there helping. So it was me and my buddy and our two FTOs. And it took all four of us to get her in this car and then she was banging her head so hard that we thought she was going to break the window with her head and our fto was like you guys got to go you guys got to go lights and sirens to the to the jail because she is just so bad and they said that was the worst code five <laughs> they've ever seen too and that one was we arrested her off the strip so public right of way but we still like we took her off the strip before trying to put her in hooks and trying to put her in the mm -hmm. car away from the public guy. Does that make sense? So, and here we were at DTAC just doing everything in front of everyone. Yeah. I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Cause I was only there for six weeks for training. 
I can't think of anything off the top of my head where we had a massive response as a result of like a fight that resulted in a large crowd. And even the events, like there were events down there when I was doing training, the events are staffed by, you know, overtime officers or officers from other areas that they augment. And we just keep doing our thing with calls for service and stuff. So, I mean, yeah, that's that. With the strip, what kind of, are they mostly just in custody calls? Do you get a lot of proactivity time? What are you looking at? And what's the difference? Because you were in bikes down there. So what does the bike officers do? Not on the strip, I wasn't. So we, I did mostly calls for service, which is your in cu- a bulk of the calls for service on the strip is in custodies. They do have some sections just east of the strip that are kind of residential that they deal with. There's one complex there off the top of my head that is notorious for cops are always there. Um, they got a few of the crappy little hotels kind of south of the main casinos south of the main strip that cause problems. There is a chance down on the strip to be proactive if you, so it it takes a lot more, like we had Sergeant Donaldson talk about a little bit, like they're down there partying, they do have the guns. It's just harder to point them out. I would say on Graveyard, you're not really proactive. Graveyard on the strip is pretty busy. And that's how, it, I feel like that's how it is in the tourist areas though. That's where everybody's out, they're partying, they're drinking, they're staying out all night with your during the day there's everybody's asleep they're hung over or just getting into town or it's too hot yeah i don't know i've only worked downtown i never worked on the strip yeah me neither so i just i have the experience from being day shift downtown where we only went down down in that tourist area when there was something big going on whether it be a fight or somebody needing our help Maybe like an attempt suicide or something, which we'll get into. But other than that, it's really during the day is just. If you wanted to compare a DTAC to Convention Center, DTAC, you have the FSE and then Convention Center is pretty much FSE, but like four miles long. Yeah, the entire area. Right. So. I don't, I can't imagine. I don't know if I could do that. It wasn't bad. A lot of the people on the department that say they don't like Convention Center have never worked it. I liked it. I had no problems with it. You're dealing with mostly normal people. You're not dealing with crazy people all the time. I mean, you are crazy homeless people come into the convention center all the time, but you, your victims are legit victims and that kind of thing. So I enjoyed it. I've never worked there. I don't know whether I'd like it or not, but I just don't know if I could handle the, it's, it feels like it's impossible to control just that long of a tourist area with all of those people. Well, you got to think too, CCAC is the biggest area command that we have. I mean, there's a lot, there's cops everywhere, especially on graveyard hours. There's cops all over that place. So, and biggest by benefit, biggest by number of officers, not area. It's only Uh, like square mile or whatever. Yeah, I don't know how, because downtown's the smallest square mile area, right? Yeah, downtown's the smallest area command. And then is CCAC second, or how does CCAC rank up with that? Uh, I'm not sure what's second. Um, Spring Valley is pretty small. I mean, well, I mean, they're big, but they're, when you compare them to the other areas, like Enterprise, Northwest, Northeast, Southeast, Spring Valley is pretty small. Well, they're not it's as small as Benjamin Center. I don't know. I think know. Bolden's another small one. Yeah, Bolden's pretty small. But didn't Bolden pick up some of Northwest? They did. Yeah, they did. but it didn't make it much bigger. True. And they lost some, didn't they? Yeah. Or no? Yeah, yeah they, they lost some of the Trop Corridor, I think, wasn't it? No. Bolden? Oh, I yeah, never mind. Never mind. That was Spring Valley. Enter- yeah, it, Spring Valley picked yes. up the top court. Yeah, Enterprise lost it. Enterprise, that's what, I, that's what I meant. Well, I don't know. I just, I was wondering because obviously there's, I mean, there's three times as many cops at Convention Center than there is everywhere else, especially Graveyard. Graveyard seems like they have all, they have all sorts of cops out there. Like cops yeah. hanging out at every casino. That's kind of one of the reasons why I guess their calls of service are probably down because there is a cop standing there to prevent crime at like every casino. Like who's going to walk in a casino to rob it when they see four cops on a bike out front? Well, there's like one person and it didn't end well yeah. for him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> there's like one person and it didn't end well for him. <laughs> People are going to look into that story now. Yeah, they're going to be like, what? What? Yeah, look into that one. Uh, the the other two things that are super important when, when you're talking about a uh, tourist area is... One, we get a little bit of different training. CCAT gets a lot of extra training. 
anyways, uh, downtown, we didn't necessarily get extra training, but we just had training to handle things different because you're in a crowd. And that's not something we're typically comfortable with or used to. So we we were able to take that training and really just make sure we were able to stay safe as we're stopping people in these big crowds. And then the other thing is you're also not just a cop when it comes to that. You're like a, you're just going to get a lot of pictures taken of you, with you, of you. There's cameras everywhere, whether it's our cameras, whether it's security cameras, or whether it's people standing there recording something or wanting to take pictures with you. The last time I worked down on Fremont Street, I took 12 pictures in like three hours. Oh, yeah. Like, it's no joke. People take want to take pictures with you all the time. Especially the later in the night goes on, the more drunk people get. Oh, yeah, I get a picture. Exactly. And it also turns over to when you're dealing with somebody or when you stop somebody, they're like, oh, like, we're going to record this. Whether it's because it's interesting to them, whether it's because they're they want to see if something happens or whether it's because they're a social justice warrior, whatever it may be. Like, we don't care. Like we're recording too. Like let them record. Um, but just as a training aspect of it, like know that there's cameras everywhere. It's one of those things you kind of get used to. Yeah. And going back to the crowd control too. Um, it's always funny to see cops from other areas that come to help us yes. out sometimes and they have no clue how to do it <laughs> and what they're doing. Yeah. We won't talk about that right now. Cause I'm still pretty bitter about, cops that don't know how to do their job in different areas but we that's a fresh one set, yeah that's a really fresh one um to set the scene though we when we go out on somebody and stop somebody especially as a bike mm -hmm. unit like you make a perimeter with your bikes you hopefully have another team of bike units there so you're dealing with the individual inside this little secured box area and your partners are watching the outside of that box area and we've, we've had, oh man, we've had instances where there's two cops and one of them has the suspect pushed up against the wall in handcuffs and the other one's back to back with him pushing people away. And then you yeah. get, you know, you get the whole area command down there. So now you have 45 cops down there escorting these people off or keeping people back or arresting people because they're still trying to get involved. It's, it can, depending on how you treat people and not even just that, just the perspective of somebody that doesn't understand. It can go from zero to 60 really, really quick yeah, so in those areas. Or just someone who yeah. doesn't know how to handle a crowd. Like, I mean, if you go somewhere working in one of the parts where all you ever deal with is residential stuff, and you come down for one of the overtime shifts for, like, a concert, and then all of a sudden people are walking out of the concert and there's people in the road, that's not really a big deal to us. We stop traffic. We let the people get out. They probably funnel out on Fremont Street, and then we go about our day. But these other people that don't know how to handle a big crowd – scream for help on the radio thinking that they're in a fight or something and we get down there and it's just traffic control like all right cool then stop the cars let them cross the street and continue with your overtime shift uh, there's 45 people jaywalking and i want yeah. them all arrested <laughs> it's not gonna <laughs> happen 45 that's really as far as like the training aspect of it that's all i can think of mainly because it's just really irritating to see cops come down there and then ruin it for everybody else yeah and we've had more of our fair shares of cops coming down and ruining it for everybody else <laughs> and usually we're the ones that end up with the paperwork exactly so there's that what if you could give advice to tourists before we really dive into this like what not to do in vegas or what not to do as a tourist i guess what is the advice you would give them before we get into it if it's illegal back home it's probably illegal here <laughs> Yeah, that's just, a good one. Just, a good come one. on. I think just because you're drunk and you might not remember it, everybody else will. So yeah. keep that in mind when you're doing stupid crap and you wake up in jail. Once it's on the internet, it's always on the internet. Yeah, don't Google my name. <laughs> We've all been on YouTube. It's fine. What about you, Fuzz? Do you have any uh, thoughts on what? Mm, no, don't do stupid stuff is good. I can't think of anything else. Don't get in fights with your wives and spouses. Yeah, just because you are in Vegas doesn't mean that you can just do whatever you want, especially relating to your family and such. So the, the topics that we kind of have, we're going to talk about kind of what we've seen and what not to do, but also we're going to talk about the effects that that has, not only like you going to jail, but maybe on you 
mentally and emotionally as well. Or financially. Financially, yeah, that's a good one. Um, the first thing is that, like, not I know the old Vegas slogan was what happens here stays here, but not everything that happens here actually stays here <laughs> unless you're going to come back for court. Yeah. Yeah. Because we don't, like I said before, we don't really, in our tourist areas, we don't really tolerate this stupid stuff. Like, if you're drunk and disorderly and you're trying to fight somebody or you try to fight us, like, you're going to go to jail because you're going to do that later in the night. Yeah. So we're really... We're doing it to try and help you either not get hurt or stay out of trouble, more trouble than you're you're in right now. But what is your guys' viewpoints of that? Yeah, definitely that saying that what happens here stays here is not true. You go to jail, it follows you, especially for the serious stuff. Oh, yeah. The felonies, the domestic violence, that stuff will definitely follow you home. Your job will definitely hear about it. And so just don't be stupid when you come to Vegas. Yeah, it's like I said, if it's illegal back home, it's illegal here. Yeah. And like Rox has brought up before, financially, like, come on now, guys. It's Vegas. You're going to lose money. So yeah. don't come thinking you're going to win on your first bet. Like, if you want to play, that's I, – I don't play because I don't have money to play with. But if you have money to play with, just be prepared, like, to either lose that and not walk away with anything or win a little bit and lose most of it. Yeah, you've got to do it as kind of like an extra thing. Like, because I do gamble every once in a while. And it's it's always has to be – extra money that you don't need for anything like you saved up you did some overtime you did something it's extra money that's not going to ruin your life the amount of people that come here with like you know after refinancing their house or selling something or doing something along those lines where they just got their rent check and they come here and blow their money and then they don't know what they're going to do once they lose because they will lose because people who make bad decisions in life make really bad decisions at table games it goes hand in hand so you're gonna lose i all i can think about is spending all my stimulus check money like so do i really even have a, an <laughs> argument about gambling because <laughs> but at least it wasn't something that i needed like it wasn't it was free money i guess if you could call it that we'll see well free money for those of us who didn't need it in the first place true true also just i don't know who or where you guys get this idea, whether it's movies or whatnot, but prostitution's illegal still. Yes. I mean, I don't know when that was supposed to change, but it's illegal, and you're probably going to get robbed. So have either of you actually looked into the prostitution laws? So it's it's something to do with, like, a county that has more than a certain amount of population. Like, Pahrump, it's legal, technically. Yes. But in, in our county, it's not, because we have a high population. Because it used to be. Vegas just used to be a desert with a few casinos and then all of a sudden we became a city and now it's illegal. And really the where all of this is stemming from is that we see we see people come into Vegas and they're partying, they're having a great time and then they do something that potentially just changes their life or ruins their life and it's either we get to them and take them to jail that side of it or they just hit rock bottom like their third day in Vegas. They hit rock bottom, and now they're standing on the edge of a casino parking garage thinking about jumping and sacrificing their life yeah. for everything that they've lost. And we've kind of seen that. We don't. I don't want to be like Debbie Downer about it. We've had examples, and there's stories we've told in the past of you know people trying to cut themselves with razor blades in their hotel rooms mm-hmm. or pulling people back off of buildings. Um, what are some experiences you guys have had with that? Um, there was this one, I wasn't working, but I heard about it. Um, I took the night off. It was a jumper off of the Four Queens downtown. When he jumped off, he his body struck the canopy, the Fremont Street Experience canopy, and it exploded into like a million pieces. And so there were body parts littered all over Fremont Street and the side of the Four Queens that the coroner and police officers had to go clean up. So not only did that individual choose to take their own life, you know, that, that decision not only affects them, it affects their family, but now we're also, they're also ruining the lives of visitors that now have to see this. Everyone who was down on Fremont street just witnessed a body explode. Like they, I mean, whether it's a good decision or not, there are families out there with kids. Right. So there was that one. There was one that Roxas and I had, it was, uh, (laughs) life is beautiful. 
So it's super slamming busy downtown. And there was, I think it was a call and they were trying to ping the phone or something. And we ended up finding them on top of the Fremont Street Experience parking garage right off Carson and the Boulevard. So Roxas, he's the talker. He's got it, getting people, talking people off ledges. So he goes up to talk to them and I'm down below and I'm like, I know what needs to be done. Like we need to block traffic and stuff, but it's so packed. It's like, where do I even mm-hmm. begin? Luckily, Roxas was able to go up there and pull him off the wall so we didn't have to get too crazy. With yeah, it, we, but... we ninja yanked him off the ledge. Yeah. Fuzz was just going to catch I, all him. I, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, I was <laughs> he was ready. Um, all I remember is looking up and then just seeing the legs go from dangling to the other side. And I'm like, oh, I think Roxas grabbed him. <laughs> and then I ran up five flights of stairs. <laughs> yeah. You're like, thank goodness they didn't come the other way because I was not ready. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of those ones, too, because when I got to the top of the stairs, when we got there and we looked at them, it's one of those things where, you know, someone's on the ledge and you, you kind of look at them and you're like, you can tell whether, you know, they're doing it for attention or they don't have the intentions of doing it. So they're just kind of there. But when we got to the top of the stairs and he turned and looked at us and he was crying and he said, I'm sorry, that was at the moment they were like, oh, crap, this might be a real one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, crap. Oh, crap. crap. Yep. Yeah, so it was a sneak attack. We both yanked him and grabbed him. and Yeah, you and someone else, not you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there was that one. What else have we, what, have we had? A, do we have any other jumper stories down on Fremont? I don't... I can't think of any other notable no, nothing, ones. nothing big. It's kind of hard to get to high places on Fremont Street, so for whoever that was to jump on that one, yeah. he got access to somewhere that he definitely wasn't supposed to be in. Yeah, to jump on top of the Yeah, that's definitely. that's a quite a height. Yeah. Um, there, I know there's a story kind of floating around the department that they tend to tell all the academies of the jumper they had off the strip where his head hit the planter and it's it decapitated mm-hmm. him. And then the head rolled like, I don't even know, like oh, 30 no. feet. They, Did you not they hear showed the story? Us no, I don't know what the you're academy. talking about. Yeah, they showed yeah, us saw the, the pictures. pictures. They showed you the pic. Yeah, they didn't show you guys Pulse. I don't know. I mean, I don't remember. It was hard to tell because they showed us the picture from like the balcony looking down, and you couldn't tell what it was. And then you know she explained it. She's like, "Yeah, this is the look down." I was like, "Holy crap!" They jumped from that height because it was a tall building. Yeah, yeah. And then when they and then they show a picture of the decapitated head, and it's like a clean cut. Yeah. Oof. Like a guillotine. Oof. And then the head just rolled. Yeah. Like a basketball. Well, that's kind of the stuff we have to deal with in the tourist areas. You don't get a ton of the, you know, people wanting to take their own lives, like with a gun or with a knife or anything. It's usually the people that are just too drunk and they just want to make a bad decision. Yeah. And most of the time, I I don't think I've had one that actually has jumped or had the opportunity or we got there after the fact. I know they happen. But for most of my experience for them, it's usually we're able to get there and either sneak up on them and pull them down or talk them out of it or what have you. Mm -hmm. Or we get to them before they even get up there because they have responsible family members or friends that are looking out for them. So little PSA, if you you need somebody to talk to or if you know somebody that needs somebody to talk to, just be there for them. Uh, maybe, Maybe talk to them or you can reach out and talk to us. We're always here. Yeah, we don't. We won't judge you because we we got enough problems of our own. We can't judge your problems as well. So I get paid to talk. Trust me, I will talk to you about anything you want. Oh, <laughs> I might be kind of worried about the people that might reach out to you and have stuff to talk about if you say whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> might need to start charging for that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think my Instagram has shown that off. I'm gonna start charging people. <laughs> Hey, quick, so quick cop question. Picture. All right, cool. Ten dollar Venmo, please. <laughs> <laughs> hey, here's my Venmo. Yeah. Put a picture of a cop, an emoji of a cop for a, a answer. Uh, Do you guys have anything else to add about any of that before we go into Roxas's PSA? Yeah, the one that I had was uh, in a hotel room where the guy had ended up hanging himself in the bathroom. But it, it kind of goes hand in hand with coming to Vegas and just ruin your life with stuff because the guy that we had had just gotten married two days before because when we walked into the room there was nothing but like sashes and alcohol and pictures and just all this stuff or this couple had just gotten married 
and then we find him in the room hanging and when our crime scene investigators get there they they took pictures and checked the phone and checked records and stuff like that and what happened was they had an argument over money in vegas and this is what he decided to do and it, it kind of goes back to like you know happens in vegas uh doesn't stay in vegas yeah especially that one man that's a it's, yeah that sucks yeah i would say that's a bulk of our like domestic calls too is uh, in the tourist areas is money. About money it's always about money it is and i mean it, it's because people don't plan ahead exactly and, and like roxas was saying if you're going to come to vegas and your budget is twelve hundred dollars and you spend you know a thousand of that on getting to vegas and your rooms and now you have two hundred dollars for you know food and drinks and stuff for two days you don't have enough to gamble yeah like you, right. you can't afford to gamble without dipping into your your money that wasn't set aside for Vegas, and that can ruin your life. That can it's all about responsibility in the end. But if you're gonna come to Vegas, just plan to have fun and plan to have the money to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, Roxas, what PSA do you got then? All right, so this one actually came from this week because of a a story. So the PSA this week is uh, security hounding you for a red card. So what we have here in the department is a red card, and it's it's like an official metro document but all it pretty much says is documents why we were there and gives us an event number for in case they want to follow up with it well the number one problem we have is we'll go to apartment complexes or something like that and you're on a dynamic call you get there you get everybody into custody you're doing your investigation you're in the middle of whatever it's going on and then all of a sudden out of nowhere a security guard will walk up right up next to you, you know, how much we hate it when people walk up on us when we're doing work. Well, they walk right up on you. They look at you. They're like, hey, I'm going to need a red card. And it's like they do either one or two things. They'll go out and they'll stand at the background and they'll just stare at you the whole time. Or they'll just stand there and just stare at you until you physically hand them a red card. So I guess this goes to like my security guys because, we you know, we got a lot of we got a lot of security friends that you know, people we deal with every day that they don't do this kind of thing, but it's, it's for the little guys that they're on shift. They don't do anything. They don't prevent crime. Like the whole point of security to walk around a neighborhood is to kind of be visible and kind of prevent this stuff from happening. So when we show up and have to deal with things, they want to have some kind of proof to their boss on the next morning when they come in that, Hey, I did something. I have a red card. Well, why don't you let us handle our business? You go stand over there and play, you know, candy crush, like you were doing when the shooting happened in the first place. <laughs> and then we'll get to you with your red card but do not walk up on us and do not hound us for a red card because we're in the middle of something and we're very busy we will get to you when either we have a second or i care enough to give you one that's my psa for this week and that kind of goes for like Anytime we are busy doing something, like you can't just walk up to us and expect us to. Remember when we talked about how some cops are like nicer than other cops and some just brush you off? Yeah. Like you're going to get brushed off in that instance. Yes. And it's not because we are trying to be mean or we don't want to talk to you, but we have other things that are a priority right now mm -hmm. to do. Like even last night, there was this lady got in a fight with somebody and then she took off in her car and. and ran into like two different cars and she was DUI and we go out there and I start talking to everybody and I end up doing my report and I go and give it to the victim that got her car hit. And she basically ends up telling me like, no, like this chick was over here fighting with this person. She got in the car and rammed this person's car mm -hmm. twice. intentionally. And I was like, wait, 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 hold up. Like this isn't a car accident. Then this is a like actual, like intentional damage to property. And it ended up being completely different. And they were like, well, we tried to go over there and tell the officers, but they were too busy, you know, yelling at her and putting her in handcuffs or doing tests with her. And I'm like, well, like they're not trying to be mean to you, but you have to understand we have something going on and something to do. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also another thing to tack onto that as well. Like with the same thing, we respond into apartment complexes and stuff quite a bit. We go to places where there is security on scene or they're in the area and they normally do spot us roll into the area and they'll hop on their go kart or whatever and they'll follow us to see what's going on. Now, a lot of calls that we go on, they aren't big calls. It's not like someone got stabbed, someone got punched, nothing big happened. It's 
someone's actually calling for some help, you know, maybe they, you know, maybe it's a medical call. Maybe it's one of those calls that comes out where it's like, Hey, you know, I need you to talk to my kid, blah, 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 something like that. Where it's, we're legit coming out to a normal family that just needs a hand and we're the people that show up. That's, that's all it is. The problem is that a lot of the times that security asks for a red card, they take it to the office and the office uses it after like one or two red cards or something, they evict these people. Now I've gotten to the point now where we'll all go to one of these calls and I'll just be there for help for somebody, this and that. And security is like, hey, I need a red card. And I'll straight up tell them, no, you are not getting a red card because I know what they're doing with it. And it's, I've gotten to that point now where it's like, uh, no, sorry, you're not getting a red card because this doesn't involve you. They didn't call you because this wasn't a big incident. They didn't need you. They need someone who, had the power to listen or assist them with something else. And that's the end of it. Yeah. It has nothing to do with them at that point. Yeah. If it doesn't have anything to do with the apartment complex and any like policies, as far as the apartment goes, there's no reason for it. It's none of their business. And in fact, it's really not even, we can't disseminate that information a lot of the time. Exactly. Either. So unless it's a legit concern for them. Yep. Well, I'm going to go to work now, that's which sucks, fun. but, uh, Little disclaimer as we close, just so you guys know, we don't rep our department or anything like that because these aren't these are just our stories and our viewpoints of things. Um, we obviously have policies and procedures that we have to follow, and so that's why we don't, you know, like shout out and rep uh, the names of our departments and such. Mm -hmm. So, just know if you guys have any issues with the things we're saying or what we have, you can you can reach out to us and talk to us, and we can explain them or we can give our viewpoints of it if you'd like, uh, as well as, like I said before, if you guys need anybody to talk to about anything for that matter, uh, that's what we're here for. We're going to do a an actual mental health episode, not just for, for us on our end, for the things that we see and deal with and how we develop that way of overcoming those traumas, but also for you guys out there or anybody out there that has any issues with any mental health things, whether it's temporary because of a situation you're going through or whether it's an ongoing problem you have. So just know we're here. Um, thanks again for listening. We appreciate you guys. If you have any questions or anything like that, we're, we're working on a lot of stuff. So just hit us in our DMs and we'll get back to you. Anybody else have anything else to add before we go? No, it's just like, uh, nope. just like, also for Pulsey said, it just, you know, we're always active on Instagram. You've got to reach out. Trust me. We're, we're all pretty active on there and we respond pretty quick. You know, a lot of our followers, like our really close people we talk to, they know, they ask us a question, even in the middle of the night, I roll over and check it. I may not be a hundred percent there to answer the question mentally out of my state of sleep, but Hey, I'll get you the best answer I can. Yeah. I woke up yesterday and I had a random text message from somebody like asking a question, like, what do I do? And I don't know who it was. And I just responded and went back to bed. Then I looked at it when I woke up and I was like, I have no idea who this is. Yeah. Yeah. And that was like a personal text message. So everybody out there, you guys have a great night. Stay safe. Have fun. Don't do drugs. And we'll see you guys next week. Yeah. Stay in all. Is school happening though? And don't buy a prostitute. Yeah. Don't get robbed by a prostitute. It's illegal. All right, guys. Stay safe. Thanks for listening.